Good morning. Two weeks ago, I taught a Sunday school lesson from this very spot. It was on the book of Proverbs, and I made a comment about Solomon writing Proverbs 2,700 years ago that are so relevant to us today that they could have been written yesterday. One such proverb was 22.6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. I will talk more about that in just a minute. Yesterday was July the 4th, and I have had some nostalgic moments during the last few days. July the 4th is probably our most celebrated holiday after Christmas, the birthday of the Christ child. Yesterday, I thought of hot dogs and hamburgers and parades and flags and songs like My Country Tis of Thee, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies, Lee Greenwood singing, God bless the USA, and the, our national anthem. One day last week, I watched on television as a mob of young people, mostly white, destroyed a statue of Francis Scott Key in San Francisco you will immediately recognize the name of Francis Scott Key as the author of the Star-Spangled Banner, our national anthem. I could not help but ask, why? What did Francis Scott Key ever do against you? Has no one ever told you that he wrote the most precious song in the English language. Certainly one of the most precious songs. Let me tell you how he came about to write this song, which was originally a poem, but later adopted as the official song of the United States of America. Francis Scott Key was a young attorney in Baltimore during the War of 1812. The British had come back to reclaim her precious colonies that she had lost during the American Revolution, and the city of Baltimore was a major target. In 1814, Francis Scott Key was asked to meet with the British Admiral on his ship in Chesapeake Bay to try to negotiate a trade of prisoners. Key was pleased that the Admiral was ready to make such a trade, and the deal was made. Many American prisoners were being held in the hull of the Admiral's ship, and Francis Scott Key went down into the hull to tell the men that they would be free to go home that very night. However, when Key got back on the deck of the ship, the Admiral told him that there had been a change in plan. Mr. Key, do you see that vast armada of ships sailing this direction? Those ships, Mr. Key, are about to launch a massive bombardment on Fort McHenry. And when the fort surrenders, and it surely will, and that giant flag is lowered, the path will be open for our troops to march into Baltimore and to completely destroy the city. 
and the war will be over. So the prisoners will be free to go home very soon anyway, Mr. Key. Key went back down into the hull of the ship and told the prisoners. The shelling started at twilight and the sky was filled with bombs and rockets hailing down on Fort McHenry. The massive flag continued to fly. The flag had been sewn by Mary Pickersgill and a few of her friends. It was 30 feet by 42 feet and could be seen for many miles. Key stayed on the deck and the men below continued to call out, Mr. Key, is the flag still up? What has happened to the flag, Mr. Key? Key could hear some of the men praying. Oh, God, please keep that flag flying with the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air. Key could see that the flag was still flying even after one, two, and three hours of steady bombardment. When the admiral saw the stars and stripes continuing to fly, he asked Francis Scott Key, Mr. Key, what is wrong with those people? Why don't they surrender? Key answered, I once heard General George Washington say, the one thing that sets the American Christian fighting man apart from all other fighters in the world is that he will die on his feet before he will live on his knees. Then it was dawn. The shelling had stopped and there was too much haze too much smoke to tell for sure whether that flag was the Union Jack or the Stars and Stripes. Key had a telescope. Suddenly, through the haze, he saw it. He saw old glory. She was tattered and smoky but Old Glory was flying above the fort and the British ships had turned around. The Admiral kept his word. The men were released and Francis Scott Key could not wait to get to the fort. He went straight to the flag and found bodies of dead soldiers all around the flagpole, which was slightly leaning to one side. What happened to all these men? He asked a young soldier. When the terrible bombardment started, the soldier answered, the flagpole was shattered at the base, and two or three of our men ran over to hold it up. When they were killed, two or three others ran over to take their places. And then two or three more. That happened over and over until finally the pile of bodies that you see around the flagpole held it in place. And the flag never came down. What is it that makes this flag so precious, so reverent? It's the blood of young men and women who have held her up in times of great threat to this country. So you see, 
I had some nostalgic moments yesterday as I thought of the words of Francis Scott Key. He wrote them in a poem in 1814, and how well these words have served us, represented us for over 200 years. I, I wonder how any American could, could feel hatred toward these words and the great flag they represent. When I read that first verse of Francis Scott Key's poem, I can almost put myself there on board the Admiral's ship. As Key says, oh say, can you see by the, by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? There is a scripture written by King Solomon in the book of Proverbs that reads like this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22.6. A few minutes ago, I asked why any American citizen would hate our flag and our national anthem. Maybe, just maybe, there are some moms and dads. Maybe there are some school teachers. Maybe there are some Sunday school teachers who fail to teach our young people the importance of faith in and loyalty to not only our Lord and Savior, Jesus, but to our country and its great history as well. In 1799, Patrick Henry said these words as he emphasized the importance of standing together as Americans. United, we will stand, he said. Divided, we shall surely fall. It is interesting to me that he got those words from Jesus. As recorded in Matthew 3, 25, when Jesus said, and if a house is divided, against itself, it shall not stand. So we know the problem. I know the answer. It is so simple. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus said, Therefore, whatever you desire that men do unto you, you shall also do unto them. We call that the golden rule. It works every time. Thank you and God bless you.